Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. District of Conservation is sponsored by CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to cfact.org. Thank you so much for listening. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. I'm glad to have Sarah Montalbano, a friend of mine and also one of my Young Voices colleagues, rejoin the podcast on a very interesting subject matter. We're going to talk about what's happening in the Tongass Forest in Alaska and this reinstatement of a 2001 roadless rule that is going to be reapplied by the Biden administration. So Sarah, thank you so much for coming back onto the podcast. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm excited to break this topic down with you. I know Alaska has been in the news about pebble mine, natural resources development, stalling of Anwar project and things of that sort. And it seems like Alaskans can't really catch a break when it comes to safely and responsibly developing their natural resources. Personally, with respect to, let's say, the Pebble Mine Project, which we don't have to go into detail and we're not going to, I wasn't so interested in the project and I didn't really support it. Uh, But in other areas of Alaska, I think the state, your home state, can comfortably and safely steward its natural resources, especially in Anwar, definitely in other areas here too. And I'm very curious to learn more about the Tongass Forest. I've heard about it. I've heard from some conservatives that Reagan wanted to preserve it. It was one of his hallmark environmental achievements. And let's give some of our listeners, let's give our listeners context behind the controversy surrounding this roadless rule and what you think the implications are. So could you give my listeners a brief explainer on the Tongass region? Why is it fragile according to some people? And why do other Alaskans want to see it responsibly developed? Sure. That's a big question, and it involves some environmental aspects and historical aspects. Uh, But the Tongass is the largest remaining temperate rainforest in the world. Um, You know, it it climbs along the Pacific Northwest and then up into Alaska's southeast region. Um, Trees like Sitka spruce, western hemlock, uh, and cedars of various types flourish there. Um, There are some people who will say, well, it's home to endangered species. That's not actually true. The Forest Service, there are no endangered species in the Tongass National Forest. Um, But it is a really beautiful region, and it is well worth um, preserving a large portion of it. However, um, the law on this topic, in 2001, uh, there is something called the Road Rule Passed, um, and it prohibits basically timber harvesting and road construction on 58 million acres of U.S. Forest Service lands. That is not just the Tongass, but it's a third of America's national forests are uh, covered by the roadless rule as it's written. And um, more than half of the Tongass uh, is covered by the 2001 roadless rule. And so what the controversy controversy has been because there have been several states that have gotten exemptions to the 2000 rule. Um, Idaho and Colorado, I believe, are working under their own version of this plan. And so Alaska petitioned many years back to have an Alaska roadless rule uh, that is specific to them uh, and that would grant some exemptions on areas of the Tongass. Um, and we'll, we'll go into a little why. I don't think it would have made all that much of a difference. Um, but the Trump administration finally made a small portion of the Tongass available for logging and road construction in 2020 by granting an exemption. And what the Biden administration recently did just on January 27th uh, was reinstate the 2001 rule. So I hope that is as brief as possible. There's been a lot of back and forth between administrations about this rule, uh, but that's that's the legal issue in a nutshell. You write in your article and it's titled, Let Alaska Develop Its Natural Resources Under the Banner of the Wall Street Journal, the preeminent Wall Street Journal, a great place to be published. And Sarah previously was a Bartley fellow with them and has published several pieces 
under a WSJ byline. And you, Sarah, you also write that the exemption that would have been granted under the Trump administration would open up 186,000 more acres to timber harvesting and only 50 more miles of new roads across 100 years. But you also add that investors never got a chance to capitalize on the small allowance. And then you go into how the Biden administration has basically said any development, reasonable development, responsible stewardship of natural resources, whether it was uh, revoking this rule, this rule, or adding a this exemption from the Trump administration and then allowing development of ANWR, which had been studied for 40 some odd years, um, it's created a lot of friction in the area. So why is it that um, outside of Alaska, a lot of people kind of don't understand what Alaskans want and, and why they want these exemptions to the roadless rule? Interesting question again. Um, Alaska... In the southeast, there were quite there were quite a few sawmills um, through the fifties and up until the nineties when there were some new restrictions passed. Um, these sawmills struggled and struggled, and there was a huge boom where they were cutting down Tongass old growth forest and shipping it off to China and Asia to be pulped. And that is obviously not an appropriate use of resources, right? We we understand that the harvesting old growth for wood chips is not a great idea. Um, the controversy has arisen because now in, in the 90s, there was a huge snapback to say, look, we are revising and canceling these contracts with sawmills. The U.S. Forest Service is not providing all the timber you need. And now the Southeast is home to about 400 logging jobs, not all of them associated with the Tongass, and one large sawmill and a few specialty sawmills. Um, So that's a huge economic issue for the Southeast. Making it so that Alaskans have to survive off of tourism alone is is really difficult. Um, And we we need the jobs in the region. Um, Not that it would necessarily add all that many to have the Tongass opened up, uh, for for reasons I'll explain, but it is difficult to have all of these projects shut down. I mean, I, in the piece, I say, look, the, on within hours of inauguration, the Biden administration had committed to reviewing this rule for mining and logging in the Tongass and um, suspended oil and gas leases in Anwar that Trump had put through. Um, there have been several other hostile actions um, so far. The Pebble Mine got to its final determination from the EPA uh, just shortly after this, shortly before this article was published. Um, and, and there are 70,000 people who live within the Tongass National Forest's boundaries. Um, and many of them want to see the forest preserved as it is, but many of them would love to be able to get around more easily with more roads. They would love to be able to do some specialty timber harvests. Um, it, it's It's just really difficult when this, the justification is always that Alaska needs to be a pristine wildlife preserve, and that's not thinking about the people who live here. That's probably a lower 48 attitude. We've talked about this before, but it, it seems like people from the lower 48 want to tell Alaskans how to steward their natural resources. And I think you mentioned in the article, too, I've heard this for other justifications to stop different projects, whether it's oil and gas leases, um, allow for hunting as a management tool in certain places. And you argue that the roadless rule reinstatement would actually even curb public lands access for scientists, teachers, and recreation. We've seen this often with lack of forest management. If you just completely, you know, close it off to multiple uses, more specifically, actually public lands, whether you close it off to uh, industry, um, grazing, cattling, um, you could also cut off access to people who go fishing and hunting. We see this often with national mm-hmm. monument designations. Am I kind of on the the right path there? Because I see that when whenever you designate certain things as more public lands, it can have a counterintuitive effect where you're actually defeating the purpose of public lands and restricting even just recreational access when you dis- disallow kind of industry or safe, responsible um, kind of uh, harvesting of different natural resources. Is that kind of the same vein with this roadless rule too? Yeah, I absolutely see that. The roads currently constructed in the Tongass are all pretty much U.S. Forest Service roads. Mm-hmm. Um, those are not high quality. They're meant to just get 
uh, logging trucks and materials in and out. Um, so that already makes it difficult. And then it's simple. It's geographic location makes it difficult to access because you either need to take the Alaska Marine Highway System or you need to have a small plane uh, take you out there. So that is a huge just geographical barrier. And then the fact that these road networks within the forest are not very well maintained, uh, it just it makes it more difficult for scientists and uh, teachers, education purposes, and then recreating in the forest. The people who live there have easy access, but it doesn't make it e as easy to go be a tourist uh, in this area. So that that's my personal take. I think... I think some people would disagree and say that it's fairly easy to access at least the point, the parts that we want to have touched. But I think there's there's probably all sorts of mysteries in that forest that would be better served if people had more access. And what would be the economic toll with this rule going into effect? Have you seen the estimates of how many jobs would potentially be lost, um, how many public land acres would be inaccessible without construction of roads? Like what will be the, the toll recreationally and economically? Do you know? That's interesting. So the Southeast has about 400 jobs right now. Um, that's down from about 4,000 in 1990 when these rules were um, revised and these contracts in timber were uh, changed to the detriment of sawmills. Um, the fact is that the Trump administration's rule came in 2020, and there wasn't a lot of time. The Forest Service already has its plan for how much wood they want to harvest from which areas and which parts are accessible. So m the crux of my argument is that volleying this rule back and forth didn't actually make all that much of a difference. And the Trump rule in 2020 would have opened up 186,000 acres and only 50 more miles of road. So we said that that's important to know because under this, there's not all that much change. And that's over a hundred years between these different rules because the, the regulatory redundancy of the U.S. Forest Service, they have their plan for the Tongass. They don't change that. Um, and reinstating this roadless rule just means that they're not able to do the little that they've been able to do anymore. Um, so it, it's going to be difficult. It's probably not going to affect the sawmills, unless the Forest Service stops meeting their contractual obligations for the amount of timber that they're providing. And what else do you want our listeners to know about the Tongass forest or the roadless rule, kind of what the immediate impact would be? Any other chatter you've heard? Yeah, I I think this is really important for its virtuous signaling aspects. Um, if I'm being honest, it's just one more way that the Biden administration is able to take a position very clearly um, that they they are hyper environmentalist. They're super on the left. They're preserving Alaska's natural resources, uh, things like that. Um, it's really it doesn't help anyone to have this kind of back and forth. All it does is it means that investors aren't going to invest. You would any any sawmill, anyone who had had made plans around the 2020 roadless rule, the Trump exemption, they they would have been absolutely disappointed by this. Um, so it's, I, I suppose that that is the main point of this is that this is mostly just an action. Um, and it does, doesn't do all that much for the forest. The forest doesn't need all that much protection. And what protection it does need is already met through the U.S. Forest Service and other uh, regulatory entities. What has been the response to your Wall Street Journal column? Has it mostly been inquisitive? I know when you wrote about a different topic that we spoke about before, there was a lot of backlash. I mean, ranked choice voting is a very controversial mm -hmm. subject, not related to conservation whatsoever. But um, what has been the response to your piece? Because I think a lot of people don't know the dynamics and it's a complicated issue. It's, you know, there's a lot of gray areas and I'm, I'm sympathetic to the plight of Alaskans who want to see this area accessible. It doesn't mean you're going to tear down the entire forest. And thank you for clarifying that the roadless rule doesn't just encompass Tongass, but many, many more places as well. Uh, but, but what do you want people, what have people rather... Um, taken away from your piece? Like, have they gotten more clarity on the issue, seen things in a different light? What is What have you been kind of absorbing from, from the responses? I think it's been generally received pretty positively. I think most people understand the fact that I'm not 
advocating that all of these projects be approved. I meant I mentioned the Tongass, I mentioned Pebble Mine, I mentioned the Willow project, which we haven't spoken about yet, but that is a uh, oil drilling project that's been held up since 2017, and the Biden administration just finally gave a scaled down recommendation. Mm-hmm. Um, we, it's there's only been a few people who say you are arguing for approval of all of Alaska's most controversial projects. And I I try to be very deliberate in the text of this piece that it shouldn't take a decade to figure out if something is safe for the environment, right? You can always decide that it's not safe, but the government doesn't need to hold up these projects so long because the average, the average for environmental impact surveys is more than five years. So, and that that's a usual project. That's not a project so controversial like the Pebble Mine that it brings in millions of dollars of out-of-state media, ad buys, um, just every environmental group on the planet was focusing on Pebble Mine. Um, so five years is a long time to withstand public scrutiny. Uh, it's a long time to be uncertain about where your investment is going. Um, and the, the absolute goal and... Uh, what's the right word? The ultimate effect of all of this back and forth and of all of these slowdowns and regulatory processes is to discourage this kind of development. And you can say, well, some of these things should be discouraged. You may be right. That depends on the environmental uh, facts of the matter. Um, But so much of this could be um, done faster and equally safely. How do you think the Alaska delegation will respond to this? I know it's probably divided since there is a new Congress person, a new Congresswoman who probably supports the roadless rule reinstatement. And I I suspect the governor and the two senators are probably against it. So what is kind of the response that Alaska lawmakers are going to have to this? Are they planning to count or to sue the Biden administration on this rule, have you heard any chatter on that? I feel like that's what a lot of people are doing to respond to these kind of wide sweeping environmental decisions. I believe that the congressional delegation, so that's um, Sullivan, Murkowski, and Peltola, our new Democratic representative in the House, I think all of them have actually been united. And I know for sure that they have all decried the Pebble decision, I think. I, I want to say that's true. Um, and they've all um, been very complimentary of the Willow Oil projects that they're able to keep going. They, you know, they welcome, um, you know, this next to last step to meeting final approval. Um, there's just, it, it's difficult with the Tongass. Uh, I, th- I think Dun- Dunleavy is in favor of, um, I, I do want to say he's in favor of the 2020 rule that had some exemptions. I'm not sure where the rest of the congressional delegation stands. Um, but there's there's been just a lot of back and forth with these things. And I know Peltola skipped out on a vote for the National Petroleum Reserve. There was a – the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, sorry. Um, that That law basically would have said – okay, well, you need to approve some more development if you were going to draw down the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. She wasn't involved in that. But I think otherwise she's fallen pretty well uh, on the camp of developing Alaska's na- natural resources safely. Interesting. That's that's interesting to hear. We'll continue I, I'll to- need to find the yeah. citations for that, but that is sure. what I, I think is true. <laughs> yeah, I think she's kind of on these more controversial subjects. She's kind of ducked and covered. Mm-hmm. Like she's not voting yeah. for certain things as it relates to this. And she's kind of like taken a, you know, middle of the road approach or not said anything. So it'll be interesting to see how she weighs on this if she hasn't already. And we can cross reference and see if she has. Sarah, is there anything else you want to talk about with respect to uh, Alaska's natural resources or anything else you're monitoring? Um, what you would like our listeners to know about your current dealings, um, any research you're doing as it relates to conservation? Interesting. Um Well, the one thing I would say to look out for is um, a final decision on the Willow Oil Project that is due, I believe, by the end of February. Um, So we should be seeing what kind of version of the the project gets approved. And that's a huge deal because that's that's one of the one of the few projects that Biden has approved during his presidency, um, especially in Alaska. 
And then the only other thing I would mention is that the roadless rule affects a third of national forests. Not all of that is in Alaska. That affects everyone. Every state has national forest lands. Most of the acreage uh, covered by the roadless rule is in the West, though. Um, So that's really important. I think other Western states need to uh, look at the exemptions that they can get, um, look at, you know, also the the federal government needs to think about smart reforms to the National Environment uh, Environmental Policy Act, um, NEPA rules that require things like environmental impact statements need to be loosened to allow more categorical exclusions. That's the word for... Um, yes. Yeah. If, if Yeah, you, you've talked about this. You know what this is. But it's basically that... Um, a project with no significant environmental impact just gets fast tracked through it. It doesn't need um, to meet all these environmental impact statements and things like that. And then the other policy portion is that litigation needs to be less disruptive um, because every project pretty much that goes through Alaska's um, permitting process gets held up in so many lawsuits, many, much of the time from national environmental groups, mm-hmm. um, and and that can kill a project in itself, even re- regardless of what the scientific consensus actually ends up being. Um, these slowdowns through um, through the permitting process is is really difficult. And and states should look at the revisiting the roadless rule because the modern scientific understanding of logging we have, we know now that uh, clearing out a lot of underbrush is actually good for forests because it reduces the amount of tinder that can cause large fires. That's mm-hmm. one of the things. We also know that, you know, when we dilly-dally in regulatory stuff like this, we get things like the antelope fire, which in 2021 ravaged the habitat of the spotted owl that can California environmentalists intended Love to, to use. save. Yeah. <laughs> Exploit. Yeah. I don't think they want to yes. save the owl. <laughs> they scared no, the, no. that poor creature. That, well, that was the stated <laughs> reasoning. Um, yes. Yeah, but I mean, that was held up for, I want to say, a decade too. And then, you know, this fire, because... These these um this uh, Tinder reduction project wasn't allowed to go through. So I I just encourage your listeners to remember that all of these actions have consequences. Um, there's so many layers of regulation that I think we are largely doing a good enough job of protecting and shepherding natural resources. Um, yeah, and that, that Mr. Biden and his administration are doing all of these really high profile things about Alaska's natural resources to show off their, their cred as environmentalists. Um, it, the rules wouldn't have done all that much. And um, it, we need more domestic resource development. That was rambly. But no, I that was eloquent. It. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, <laughs> where can everyone connect with you? I want you to share all the links again. You, you write on a whole host of issues you are with me at Young Voices. We're both regional leaders. You have social media. Dispense all the links if you can. Absolutely. I can be found on Twitter at Sarah Montalbano, and the O is a zero. Um, so you can find me tweeting not so eloquently there. Um, you can also find my regular, my day job is with Alaska Policy Forum. I'm their education policy analyst. Um, so you can read my work about Alaska's education system at alaskapolicyforum.org. Um, and then, like I said, uh, well, like you said, um, I am with Young Voices. I am the Northwest Regional Leader. Um, so you should find me there at young-voices.com and go through our staff page um, to read the coverage I've done there. And uh, I have an email there if you would like to get in touch with me. Perfect. Yes. And if you want to write about natural resources, responsible development of it, conservation, kind of these more complicated, sticky issues with public lands and private property, we encourage you all. This is not Young Voices paying me to say this. This is me just dispensing this out there or sharing this, that a great vehicle, if you want to submit yourself for consideration to our contributor program, you can work under us and our editors if you get accepted and write about these really awesome, convoluted, controversial, but 
illuminating subjects and you will benefit a lot from, from doing so. And Sarah and I have both graduated from that. And now we're working with others to mold them and shape them and influence them uh, on a whole host of issues, including this one. So Sarah, thank you so much for coming on to talk about the Tongas, to talk about this roadless rule and why it needs kind of this attention and kind of this careful attention to detail to understand all the facets with it and kind of how wide sweeping decisions can have often deleterious consequences. So we appreciate you coming on to talk about this really timely matter. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't already, make sure you find us on your preferred podcast player. We largely circulate on Apple, Spotify, and countless others, but those are two big podcast platforms we want to push. Make sure you're subscribed there, especially on Apple. If you like the podcast a lot, go leave us some reviews. We'd be more than grateful to get some five-star reviews from you guys. Moreover, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and a little bit on YouTube. We don't populate there, but connect with us on social media. Find me personally on social media with blue check marks super easy to find. And I would love to hear your feedback and know who you'd like to see on the podcast. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. Stay tuned for the next episode.